Hello, everyone. Welcome to Word of Hope, an online Bible study, taking a look at the lessons for this coming Sunday, Palm Sunday. We're going to start in the book of Psalms, Psalm 118. First of all, a little history about Psalm 118. We don't know the specific occasion in which Psalm 118 was written, but it was written to underscore a victory that God's people through the king had achieved. Psalm 118 talks about God's people triumphing over their enemies. Uh, the, the enemies of God's people seemed insurmountable, but God in his power guided the warriors of Judah and Israel to victory. I always imagine, the Bible doesn't say this, but I always imagine that David wrote this psalm as he experienced victories over the enemies that were thwarting the will of God around the city of Jerusalem and in the nation of Judah. So that's the first thing. It is a, a liturgical psalm of joy as God's people came together to rejoice in the deliverance that God had given to them. The second thing about Psalm 118 is as you read it, you'll see that there are messianic overtones. So there are portions of scripture that certainly applied to the people at that time, like David, but they also point ahead to what Jesus Christ will do and what Jesus Christ achieved. Ultimately, how Jesus Christ triumphed over his own enemies of sin, death, and Satan, which he triumphed for you and for me. So I have those two thoughts in mind as you work through this psalm. Uh, a victory for God's people, but also a victory, a prophecy of the victory that Christ will give us. Let's take a look at some points in particular. Psalm 118, it begins with a, a joyful call to thanksgiving. Isn't that supposed to be, or isn't that a wonderful reminder for the life that we are to lead? A life of thanksgiving for the blessings that God showers down upon us. So we give thanks to the Lord. Why? Because of his love. And so great is his love that the psalmist is going to repeat that in verse 1. He's going to repeat it in verse 2. He's going to repeat it in verse 3. And he's going to repeat it in verse 4. Verses 6, 7, 8, and 9 is a beautiful picture and comfort for us in our own trials and tribulations and certainly for God's people, the nation of Judah, as they were beset by trials and tribulations, God delivered them. And Psalm 118 is just a beautiful reminder for you and for me as well, that in the midst of whatever trials and tribulations we might be facing, we look to the Lord and he is there for us. He's there to strengthen us. He's there to help us. Uh, verse 10, 11, 12. Again, this is the psalmist reflecting upon the physical nations that surrounded the nation of Judah, but God and his people were victorious. It's also messianic insofar as these can be applied to Jesus as he plummets to the depth of his passion and his suffering. Other portions of scripture uh, reflect Jesus saying these things about himself. The enemies have surrounded me. Um, verse 12, they swarm around me like, like bees. But the Lord, verse 14, but the Lord is my strength and my salvation. Verse 15, what is our response? We will be filled with joyfulness. We will be filled with the victory that God has given us in Christ. Uh, verse 22 is also messianic. Jesus applies this to himself. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Maybe in your version you have the Lord, the 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 stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The cornerstone and the capstone are very different, but they both convey the same thing. Is it, is a, if, it, if Christ is the counter, cornerstone, he is the building block on which 
the church rests. If Christ is the capstone, he is the final stone that is placed into an archway that ultimately supports the entire arch. So if Christ is the cornerstone, he's the building block. If Christ is the capstone, he's the crowning achievement of God's plan fulfilled in the church. Uh, verse 26, uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord from the house of the Lord. We bless you. Jesus applies those words to himself. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, uh, re referencing himself. Verses 28 and 29 underscore, again, an exhortation on our part to be filled with praise and a life abounding in thankfulness to God. Zechariah chapter 9. Zechariah is an interesting book. There are portions of the book of Zechariah that are apocalyptic, that is detailing future events through dreams and visions. If you read the book of Zechariah, you, you will see that there's similarities in some of the themes and ideas that the book of Revelation has, as well as the book of Daniel. In the ninth chapter, there is a messianic portion where the deliverer comes to Jerusalem. And you can very clearly see in this how the prophet Zechariah, 500 years before the event occurs, details that the Messiah will come into Jerusalem on, of all things, a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. Uh, verse 10 underscores for us also the theme that we see in Psalm 118, just as God defeated the physical enemies of his people detailed in Psalm 118, so the book of Zechariah details that the physical enemies of God's people will be defeated, but it's the spiritual enemies that are described in the, the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem. Also, God in this verse underscores that in this messianic covenant, there will be no need for these physical defenses because the kingdom that Christ will establish will be a spiritual kingdom. The, the, the spiritual kingdom and the church itself grooms and grows and blossoms because of the proclamation of the gospel. Verse 12 reminds us that uh, prisoners of, of the nation of Judah shall return. And also, it's a beautiful picture for you and for me. Prisons of our own doing, whatever they might be, we turn to the Lord and he releases us. Uh, the next lesson, Philippians 2, 5 through 11, one of the, the truly most remarkable passages, I know I say that a lot, but really one of the most remarkable passages in Scripture. The Apostle Paul gives us an incredible Christological truth as to who Jesus was and what he accomplished for us. And he applies it to the relationships that we have with each other. In your relationships with another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Or maybe in your Bible, I kind of like this translation a little bit better. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. So isn't that a great exhortation for us in our lives? Our attitudes, our lives, and in our relationships with one another, we are to be guided by Jesus Christ. And why is Jesus Christ so amazing? Paul tells us, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, to be used to his own advantage. Think of Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. Jesus was tempted in the wilderness and ultimately those temptations by Satan were a temptation to use his divinity for his own worldly gain. Even though it was something so simple, to use that divine power to turn stone into bread, Jesus would have been using his divine nature for his own advantage. But Christ didn't do that. He made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. 
that is laying aside his divine glory, being revealed to the world as a common everyday man. Jesus was still true God. In Jesus, he is true God and true man brought together in the person of Jesus. There are times in Jesus' life where we certainly see his divine nature, where he does miracles, certainly in his teaching, uh, certainly, of course, where he triumphs over death itself by raising himself. But in all of these things, he does it with the humbleness and the, the attitude of a servant to accomplish God's will and God's plan. The last lesson, the gospel lesson, uh, John chapter 12. So this is right before, uh, from a historical perspective, right before Jesus celebrates the Passover with his disciples. And the, there's some people that want to see Jesus. They come to see Jesus and there's this beautiful statement that Jesus makes. Now the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I think that's one of the most ironic statements in Scripture, isn't it? Now the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. If I were to ask you, how might I glorify you, what would you say? Would you say, well, you could publicly honor me. You could give me a, a gift. You could give me a financial gain and and all of us would say yes that would that would give me glory but when jesus says now is the son of man glorified this is right at the beginning of his passion so jesus is going to be forsaken beaten bloodied bruised ultimately flogged and crucified and he says yes that is glory that is glory in his obedience to achieve it and it is glory in what, as, in what is accomplished through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, verse 25, wonderful exhortation for us in our lives. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it. So to find our life uh, by ourselves is to live by our own standards and own rules. Uh, hates their life. Uh, the, the word hate there is probably not the best translation of what the Greek says. The word, the word in the Greek is miseo, which actually means to love less. And I, I think that that's really important for us to take to heart. Jesus isn't saying live with the attitude of I hate my life. My life is so horrible. He's just underscoring for us to love our life less than ultimately what we love him. So yes, I love life. I greet every day. I love every aspect of my, my job as a pastor. I love being able to talk to you in your homes through this Bible study. Yes, I love life. And that's a good attitude to have. So when Jesus says hating this life, he's underscoring for us to love less. So ultimately, as much as we can love and embrace what this world has to offer and the various jobs, positions, duties, and, and activities that, that we're engaged in, we still need to remember our number one priority, which is serving God and serving others. It's interesting, too, in verse 23, he says, Now the Son of Man is glorified. But then in verse 27, Now my soul is troubled. Why is Jesus' soul, why is Jesus' soul troubled? His soul is troubled because he recognizes everything that's going to transpire. It's so important to remember that as we see the passion of our Lord unfold. He recognizes everything. He knows full well the pain and the sorrow and everything that will transpire. So it's very natural for Jesus to say, now my soul is troubled. What does he say? Save me? No. For this very reason, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. So ultimately, God the Father will be glorified. The Son will be glorified. The Holy Spirit will be glorified by Jesus accomplishing for you and for me redemption. The Heavenly Father speaks um, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. 
uh, Jesus in verses 30 through 34 underscore for us that the voice was spoken for the benefit of, of those around. And the fact that this is recorded for us, isn't it a wonderful encouragement for us that these words are written for our benefit as well? That the Heavenly Father is glorified in the Son's obedience. Uh, verse uh, 35 and 36, Jesus is the light of the world. What a wonderful encouragement for us. And with that, bring to a close the Bible study uh, for this week. God bless you in your journey. And may God's word and scripture be opened up more deeply to your understanding. Have a great week. Hello, everyone. Glad that you enjoyed Word of Hope. Just an exhortation for you. Our numbers are slightly down in this Bible study format, the Word of Hope. If you find it helpful, if you find it useful, pass it along to other people. We would like to get our numbers back up that we can continue to do this. Touch people's hearts and your walk of faith may be strengthened. So if you like it, spread the word. Have a great day.